I am both thrilled and honored to be here among you and to visit for the very first time your wonderful country of Ireland. And I'm also uh, profoundly touched and moved by your compliment of being called a soul doctor. That uh, was the first time anyone has ever referred to me in that manner. And yet, the reason it is so personal to me is because it is my belief that hypnotherapy can help heal this planet. And I feel a passion about hypnotherapy and about doing it properly. Notice I did not say perfectly, because the quest for perfection is an illusion. We're all artists of the art of hypnosis. And no two of my students do hypnotherapy in exactly the same manner, because just as I have taken the teachings of the late great Charles Hevitz and have updated them and modified them according to my own personality and style, I encourage my students to do likewise, because I believe that for hypnotherapy to survive into the 21st century, we must take what we learn from our mentors and evolve and be willing to learn from others because we are all each other's teachers and students. So with that in mind, it is my wish, it is my desire that this will be a weekend of sharing because I'll be the first to admit that while I have been blessed with a lot of wonderful wisdom from the late Charles Hevitz and have been gifted in certain <coughs> areas, I don't know all the answers, and the longer I'm in the hypnotherapy profession, the more I realize that there is the know, so that we're only scratching the top of the tip of the iceberg. Parks therapy is a profound technique, a profoundly beneficial technique used properly. And while I do believe totally in the benefits of parts therapy, there is no technique, including parts therapy, that is so good that it will work for all the people all the time. And I want to preface this weekend by saying, even though I believe in parts therapy and teach and practice parts therapy, it's not for everyone. It's not indicated for every one of my clients. So during the course of the weekend, we will be talking briefly about when and why you should use parts therapy. And we'll touch on a few times where you might not want to use it. But before we get started, information is, I believe that we as hypnotherapists need to fit the technique to the client rather than trying to fit the client to our technique. And here's one area where I have updated the work of the late Charles Tevitz because he attempted to use parts therapy with almost everybody he saw to discover causes. And while parts therapy is great for uncovering causes, it's not necessarily indicated with everybody who walks through your office. So I have taken something that Charles Tevitz only occasionally taught and have built a, around it as a foundation or a therapy model, and I call it the four hypnotherapeutic steps to facilitate change. And our mind that I would consider exploring on Sunday, such as, and this goes hand in hand with what Joe Keeney called me, being a soul doctor, I would like to share with you some things that I did not write about in my book. Some things that I can't even teach on the campus of Tacoma Community College, where I'm required to take more of a secular approach. What I would like to share with this group, if there's enough interest, is some of the spiritual applications of parts therapy, such as calling on the Holy Spirit or higher self within, calling on the higher power when you're stuck and can't seem to help somebody come to resolution. Because you see, as I have said before, and am very quick to admit saying, I don't have all the answers. And the minute you think you do, you're liable to make a mistake. And there are so many therapists out there who end up thinking they know the answers, and as a result, they do inappropriate leading instead of guiding, and the result is confabulation, false memories, people thinking, this when maybe it was that. People thinking that maybe their problem was caused by past sexual abuse or past this or they sarped it up in a past life or maybe they had a demonic entity or maybe they were abducted by a UFO. And the problem is whether your belief 
in forming this diagnostic conclusion is based on science or based on religion or based on intuition or based on spiritual belief or simply based on a psychological evaluation. What happens if your opinion is wrong? and you project that opinion into the trance, you end up obtaining the trance. So this is some very important background information. When you're doing trance work, be objective, be unattached to the outcome. The only outcome you want to be attached to is your hope for the best resolution. Not the one you necessarily think is the right resolution, but hope for the best resolution for your client's highest and best good. And if you proceed on the basis of seeking your client's greater empowerment, then you're far more likely to succeed than if you form your own preconceived opinions about the cause of uh, your client's situation. Because hypnotherapy solicits the subconscious to reveal the cause. So, I have some notes over here on the board. You also have these notes in the Exploring Parts Therapy. And I hope the sound picks up. Maybe if I bring this over, this will still uh, get up on the video. In your notes, you have a section on the first couple of pages about the four hypnotherapeutic steps to facilitate change. There is a direct connection between this and not only parts therapy, but any advanced hypnotherapy technique you use. I have actually considered this to be the foundation of effective hypnotherapy. The four cornerstones to this foundation. Suggestion and imagery are great if there's a strong motivating desire to change. So for motivational goals, like sports enhancement, things like that, and maybe even uh, simple self-hypnosis for stress management, suggestion and imagery might be sufficient for some of the people some of the time. But when there's resistance to change, <coughs> this is where hypnotherapy differs from hypnosis. This is where hypnoanalysis comes in. This is where it becomes important to consider the building blocks or four cornerstones or four objectives of hypnotherapy. Discovering the cause doesn't mean diagnosing the cause because I tell my students and I tell my clients that I am neither trained nor licensed to diagnose physical or mental illnesses. However, it is my personal and professional belief that when you use effective hypnotherapy techniques, you can solicit the client's subconscious to reveal the cause of the problem. And it doesn't matter whether that cause is a real memory or a false memory, because even if the alleged cause is not remembered correctly, if the subconscious believes it to be true, the subconscious will be responding as though the perception is true. So while your scientific mind set might be obsessing on whether or not that was fact or fantasy, and take somebody through 30, 40, 50, 60, or 70 weeks of regressions to sort out all of the truth from the fiction. My approach is simply to help the client's subconscious understand the perceived cause <coughs> so that release can be attained. And release involves understanding the emotional significance, much like cause and effect, so that there's a little bit of going back and forth between discovering the cause and release, because understanding the cause of the problem and its effect facilitates understanding self-forgiveness must take place. I'm no longer hung up on the idea that the client has to forgive the alleged perpetrator simply because I don't argue over semantics. I believe strongly in the power of forgiveness. But some clients have a different definition of forgiveness than I do. My definition of forgiveness means to release somebody of the need of apologizing to me. Some people's idea of forgiveness means their sins are as white as snow, 
And forgiving means condoning, as though the actions were okay. To me, forgiving does not mean condoning. So if a client believes that forgiving means condoning, I simply ask that client to release the other person to God or a higher power or his or her karma or to fate and forgive themselves for buying into the problem in the first place. Then once the cause is discovered and released, the fourth step is subconscious relearning because it makes no difference if a client's cause of smoking is discovered and released, if that client walks out of your office believing that he's going to backslide because he's smoked for the last 30 years. And here's where some people who have used regression to cause for smoking have not had successes because the subconscious freedom will never took place. It gets back to belief, imagination plus expectation equals a conviction. And if all of those are added together, you get results. And the results will either be achievement of a goal or backsliding based on the belief and the expectation. And it starts in the imagination because imagination is the language of the subconscious. A little bit of necessary background information on what I've covered here in the last 10 minutes. I spent a lot of time covering in depth in my beginning class and in the first part of my intermediate uh, quarter at Tacoma Community College. But I understand from Joe Keeney that all of you have been very confident and framed. So I really don't think I need to spend much time on this, except to emphasize that you can use this as a building block for any therapy technique, whether it's parts therapy, regression therapy, or a technique that hasn't been invented yet. Ask yourself, how does this technique that you're learning in a workshop now, in a workshop in the year 2002, how does it fit in to the overall four therapy objectives? Which step or which steps will it help you accomplish? <coughs> Once you remove the emotional blocks by getting at the cause and facilitating the release, then there's a lot of uh, carryover between steps four and step one in the sense that you have to give suggestion and imagery to help facilitate the relearning. But once you have the cause released, you're unencumbered, you're now free to do so. Okay, looking at parts therapy. Which of these steps might parts therapy accomplish? The cause? Yes, you bet. How about release? You bet. How about subconscious relearning? You bet. And then, because you can give post hypnotic suggestion to individual parts after the terms of agreement are reached, parts therapy is one technique that can incorporate all four therapy objectives. And while it is one of the most complex techniques I know of for hypnotherapy, it is also one of the most thorough, if not the most thorough, in that parts therapy alone, properly used, incorporates all four of these steps. Regression therapy accomplishes steps two, three, and four, but not number one. Therefore, parts therapy really is more complex than regression therapy. So this is some important background information I wanted to provide as a workout. Now, in terms of what parts therapy is, it goes by various names. Voice dialogue, ego states therapy, and I've heard other names for it. Uh, I like to say that uh, it's like wearing different hats. And I explain it to a client generally in as simple a language as possible. We all have different hats we wear. I have a hat that I wear when I'm teaching. I have a therapy hat that I wear when I'm doing therapy. I have a little boy's hat that I wear when I have time to play. I have a romantic hat that I wear. And there's an accountant 
that comes out that sometimes argues with my conscious mind, we don't want to go to the Friday night movie, we can go to the Saturday matinee for half the cost. And sometimes the inner CPA wins, and sometimes the little boy inside wins, realizing I've worked hard this week, let's go to a movie tonight because uh, I deserve it. And in a balanced state of mind, we are aware of these differing emotional parts, or as Charles Tebbets called them, ego states. When somebody has a strong inner conflict about a goal they wish to reach, such as a smoker trying to quit and feeling a part of him or her is strongly sabotaging every best effort to quit, then two parts are in conflict and the conscious mind is no longer able to control the outcome. So in hypnotherapy, we can actually call out these various parts. So I'll tell a client, I'll look a client straight in the eye and say, if I was in a hypnotic trance, a competently trained hypnotherapist could have my CPA actually have a dialogue with my inner child. I'm consciously aware of each part, but I'm feeling the different emotional energies of each part as I'm speaking, as though my conscious mind is sitting on a shelf observing and yet feeling at the same time. And it's a very strange process to describe in terms of how I feel. Nonetheless, it doesn't mean that uh, there's any type of multiple personality present. It's just that we have these various hats we wear in life. So in essence, I give an explanation in less than five minutes to my client. And as Charles Tebbets used to say, keep it simple. The more you keep it simple, the greater the probability of a client understanding it. And this advanced explanation is absolutely vital before you proceed with parts therapy. Without the advanced explanation, if you attempt parts therapy, you do have the risk of a client leaving your office wondering if he or she is an undiagnosed multiple personality. <laughs> and it is better to prepare the client in advance if you plan on using or think you might need to use parts therapy so that they don't walk out of your office uh, wondering where all of these subparts came from. Now, what I would like to do is read a segment of an article written by Charles Tebbets. And we do not have photocopies of this article. And originally I had planned on giving photocopies of this, but there are actually sections of this article that I consider now to be outdated. I'll explain why in a minute. But let me read the relevant parts. This was actually written by Charles Tebbets and it's a handout that I give to all of my students in my class back in Seattle, Washington. In 1952, I read the works of Ferdern, and my experience to that date convinced me that he was on the right track. He described Freud's ego states, id, ego, and superego, as resembling separate personalities, much like the multiple personalities in the celebrated case of the three faces of E, but differing in that no one of them exists without the awareness of others. I find, however, that in many cases, different parts take control while the subject is in a light trance state of which he or she is unaware. A bulimic will experience time while binging when one of her parts takes over and eat for over an hour, believing only five minutes has passed. Another personality part then suffers shame and remorse. Both parts know that the other exists. But the first is unaware of the other's existence during the period of deviant behavior. Every individual is made up of parts, and the concept should always be explained to them before this type of therapy is used. Otherwise, they might believe that they are multiple personalities. You might explain it to them in this manner. Everyone is made up of various parts. Often a person might think, I really want to take a vacation, but a part of me won't let me. Or, part of me wants to get thin, but another part insists on eating. While a client is hypnotized, the therapist may ask to speak to the part causing the symptom, or he may call out the part that wants to get rid of it. Ask the part what name it wishes to be called. Ask the part causing the problem its reason for doing so. Ask the part that wishes to eliminate the system to talk to the offending part. By this time, you know their names or titles, etc., and plead its case. Once the parts concept is accepted by the subconscious, other parts often speak up and the therapist takes 
the role of arbitrator or mediator. Now, up to this point, I agree totally with the article written by Charles Tevitz. The next section I will not read, but any of you who have read the now out of print book, Miracles on Demand, may understand that Charles Tevitz started debating with the offending parts. I recognized the risk involved and brought that to Charlie's attention while he was yet living. And prior to his death, he did agree with me that if you start debating with the dominant part or with the part get rid of the problem, or you start debating with the part that's causing the problem, you can end up alienating one or both parts. For example, let's say you two gentlemen had a disagreement and you couldn't resolve it among yourselves and you asked me if I could help you resolve it. And I hear your case. What is your name? Paul. Paul, okay. Jared. 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 Yeah, Jerry. Jerry. Yeah. Okay. <coughs> well, Jerry, uh, I heard Paul and he has a pretty good argument. And by golly, you know, I, I think that it really is important for you to take to heart what Paul said. Um, and uh, I think that uh, the mature thing to do would be for you to change your behavior. Now, what's happened to my rapport with you? It's broken. You've taken his sleeve away. That's right. Okay. Now, you break rapport with the part and you break rapport with the subconscious. One of my former students failed to heed my advice on that and the lady popped right up out of trance. The part they broke rapport with reamed him and then you couldn't get the woman back into hypnosis again. So it is really important to stay neutral. Now, Paul has expressed himself, and I look at you and I say, you've heard Paul's case, now Paul is going to listen while you present your case. Talk as long as you want. And we will both listen and enlighten us as to why you feel the way you do. You feel much safer about talking now, don't you? Yeah. Okay. And you, knowing that I heard you without interrupting, you also feel a greater respect towards me. And both of you would have a sense that I'm genuinely attempting to help you have a mutually acceptable resolution, right? This is what you must do in parts therapy. Consider yourself like a mediator with conflict resolution. And you want all parts to be able to communicate safely. What's the number one complaint children tend to have about their parents? Mommy never listens. Or daddy doesn't listen. Okay? The parts don't feel like they're going to be listened to. So you must create a safe environment, a safe opportunity for a part to express itself and be heard and be listened to. The only way I can possibly help the two of you reach a mutually acceptable resolution is if each of you first has a chance to air your gripes. Once the gripes are aired and the emotional energy is discharged or released, now we have a basis to build upon, don't we? Okay, so this is in essence what we do with parts therapy. We provide a safe opportunity for the parts to express. Parts therapy then could be likened to the metaphor of conflict resolution, except rather than being with several people, it's inner conflict resolution with several parts. So, with this as a working model, we can build from here. Do we have questions or comments up to this point for many of you? Very, very mature group here. <laughs> okay. All right. Moving right along. There's one section I want to read out loud on page two. <laughs> This was taken from Miracles on Demand. There's a little bit of repetition here between this comment and the article written by Charles Tevitz that I quoted from. But I have a reason for reading this. In 1952, Federn described Roy's ego states. 
Id, ego, and superego as resembling separate personalities, much like the multiple personalities illustrated in the celebrated case of the three faces of Eve. Okay, so far this sounds just like the article I read, doesn't it? One thing I noticed about the late Charles Tevitz, he gave credit where credit was due. Now I'll confess, I don't really know who Verdern was, but obviously Charles Tevitz knew who Verdern was. And some people think Charles Tevitz learned parts therapy from Gil Boyan, but apparently he learned it from Verdern in 1952. That's what Charlie told me while he was living. So I really don't know for sure whether he learned it from Gil Boyan or whether Gil Boyan learned parts therapy from Charles Tevitz. And in my opinion, it doesn't matter who learned it from whom. Thank God that Charles Tevitz taught it because it has helped unlock keys and it has helped people change where other hypnotherapy techniques have failed to produce results. Okay, now Charlie goes on here, I find that in many cases different parts take complete control while the total individual is in a trance state of which she is unaware. And then he goes through the same comments about the bulimic, bulimic experiencing time distortion. But I want to continue over here on page three, second paragraph from the top, Mr. Tevis continues. Surely at some time you have thought, sometimes I feel that I want to do something, but at other times I think I would like to do the opposite. The well-adjusted person is one in whom the personality parts are well integrated. The maladjusted person is one in whom they are fragmented and internal conflict exists. Sometimes your clients will be aware of the internal conflict. And if they come in and uh, you've seen them a couple of times for weight management or for smoking cessation, and they come in expressing a great inner conflict about it, it may be very obvious that parts therapy is called for. Other times, it might not be quite so obvious. So, from that standpoint, you want to find out, is there an inner conflict? And if you're not sure, you can always hypnotize the client and use figure response questioning to find out. How many of you have used figure response questioning or video motor responding? This is, while it's an amazingly easy technique, it's also a very risky technique in a very subtle way. And let me explain what I mean by that. Out of all of the appropriate hypnotic techniques that I know of to discover causes, you can unintentionally lead more abruptly and more inappropriately with finger response questioning than anything else without knowing that you're leading if you're not careful. Here's where it's very important to set aside preconceived opinions because in regression therapy leading can be direct and risky causing false memories. In finger response questioning if you're not careful you can end up leading without realizing you're leading simply by using wrong vocal inflection. Now, being an artist, I have not only practiced but have written in my book, uh, particularly in the first one, The Art of Hypnosis, about the use of vocal inflection, especially when you're doing imagery, uh, putting emphasis on certain suggestions to increase the emotional response, such as imagine your most important benefits in ways that are so satisfying feel as though you already enjoy success. And it just feels so wonderful to be at your ideal weight. Feel that sense of satisfaction as you imagine seeing your ideal self reflected in a mirror, feeling the clothes that you wear, fitting comfortably. Imagine being in a situation where you totally enjoy being at your ideal weight. This type of emphasis in your own personality and style is terrific when you're doing imagery. But it's taboo when you're doing finger response questioning. Of all the times in hypnosis when you must talk in a monotone, 
It's when you do finger response questioning. I have personally sat at national hypnosis conventions and witnessed facilitators standing up there in front of a hundred hypnotherapists from around the United States and in other countries doing finger response questioning going on saying something such as was this problem caused by an authority imprint? Was this problem caused by uh, identification with a mentor? Is this problem caused by an entity? Are you having influence by an outside entity? You see how such emphasis can elicit a yes response? So you have to really be careful not to have formed a preconceived opinion. And if you have a belief that this problem, say, was caused by a past painful event, do your best to avoid projecting that into the finger response questioning. If you need to, train yourself with self-hypnosis to talk in a monotone. Use self-hypnosis or have somebody else hypnotize you to give you a monotone trigger so that when you touch your thumb to your little finger, it's an automatic reminder that you speak in a monotone and you do not vary your pitch or your tempo or your volume so that you can ask your idiomotor response questions in a way that will not elicit a yes or no response. Extremely important if you want clarity in the answers that you elicit from the client's subconscious. So those are my comments on figure response questioning. That being given as background information, if you're unsure about whether there's an inner conflict, you can go through what Charles Tevitz called the psychodynamics of a symptom, asking about past imprint, uh, present unresolved issue, inner conflict, and asking a series of questions. If you use finger response questioning, always tell the client's subconscious you are going to ask a series of questions that can be answered yes or no. And then, rather than establishing a formula of, if I say a question and the answer is yes, move your right index finger, it doesn't matter what your reason is for choosing the right index finger. Why might it be a problem to have somebody's right index finger be designated as a, as a yes finger? Can anyone tell me? Um, it should be, it might be designated as a no finger. Right? Indeed. Did all of you agree with that? It may have been designated as a no finger in a previous therapy session six months or six years earlier. Always let the client's subconscious tell you which finger or thumb represents yes. And then make a note of it. I'll put Y equals RI for right index finger in my client notes, or LI for left index finger. Then second question, if I ask you a question and the answer is NO, please choose a different finger or thumb that represents the negative response. And indicate now. And then I'll put RT for right thumb, or uh, RP if it's a right pinky. Sometimes people use their pinky. Sometimes they'll use a whole hand. I'll put RH for right hand. Um, and then a third question that I ask. If I ask you a question and the answer is either I don't know or I'm not ready to respond, Choose a different finger or thumb that represents that response and indicate now. And then I'll put question mark equals LH for left hand or what have you. Now, I have a very important reason for doing this because if a person has a strong desire to lie under hypnosis, they may indeed do so. And sometimes the subconscious can be very clever at covering up. And those of you who have been in the profession a few years can totally understand what I mean by that. And I myself have been on the receiving end of hypnotherapy where I've had to spend more sessions than I really needed to because my own subconscious covered up and the therapist didn't know how to get past the subconscious cover up. Not that I wanted to cover up, but there was something very difficult to remember back in my childhood that was very important for a therapy uh, goal that I had about 10 years ago. 
and I had to go to three or four different hypnotherapists before I finally got past it, and I finally had to ask one of my own former students to be the one to help me past it, because at least I knew that person's training. <laughs> so, one of my own former students helped me past an obstacle that other therapists who had been in business longer than I had were unable to, because they had their own ideas. They were doing what I now realize is therapist-directed trance work instead of client-centered hypnotherapy. They have their own preconceived opinions about the inner child. And why well, do inner child work? And everything I do revolves around the inner child. That's great. But uh, I worked with a man for confidence years ago, and when I went back to regression to core cause, his confidence problem happened at age 24 when uh, the dishonest contractor that he was working for skipped the country with uh, $200,000 and left him losing his house and having to pay all of the subcontractors and going out of business and failing financially and having to file bankruptcy. Had nothing to do with the inner child being hurt at age 6 or age 10 or age 12. And yet two other hypnotherapists had regressed him back to a time when he was 6 and his father in a temper tantrum broke a wine glass on his forehead. He'd already worked through that. That had already been released but he still didn't have professional confidence because the core cause had never been uncovered as a result of previous regression therapists getting caught up in this inner child work modality. This is why getting caught up in a modality might help some of the people some of the time, but may leave others who could be helped unhelped because they needed a different approach. So again, Client-centered hypnosis means fitting the technique to the client. Indeed, while parts therapy may help a lot of people who might not be helped with a modality approach, even parts therapy isn't going to help the person who has a, a fear of elevators. Because in those cases, I'll use regression to cause. Now, I also learned never say never because years ago, I had a psychiatrist for a student who said, have you ever used parts therapy during a phobia? And I said, no. I said, I cannot imagine a reason for ever having to use parts therapy to help somebody overcome a phobia. Well, guess whose phobia was the very first one that caused me to have to use parts therapy? <laughs> <laughs> the psychiatrist. She had a fear of dogs. And her husband and children wanted a dog. And she wanted to be the volunteer for uh, phobia for the fear of dogs. <coughs> And after using regression to the core cause and releasing the cause, both the original sensitizing event and the activating event that activated the phobia, which was a vicious dog attack, she still was having an inner conflict with that part of her that realized big dogs are dangerous, especially if they're not on a leash. So I ended up having to use parts therapy to help her come to her own resolution. I won't go into the details of what it was, but at the end of the session, she comes out out of hypnosis and says, wow, that solution is so simple. I don't know why I didn't think of that. And I looked at her and I said, you did think of it. <laughs> <laughs> That's the beauty of parts therapy, because the client is discovering their own best resolution. And all you are doing is asking the right questions to help empower the client rather than sitting there trying to spoon feed the answers by loading your client's subconscious with uh, miles and miles of post-hypnotic suggestions, you are enabling the client to come up with his or her best resolution for the desired outcome. And then you simply use the post-hypnotic suggestions at the end of the parts therapy session to help uh, water the seeds that the client has planted in his or her own subconscious. That's one of the beauties of parts therapy. Now, I realize that I've already told you parts therapy is a very complex technique, and in a sense, one of the most complex, if not the most complex hypnotherapy technique I know of. However, that being said, while it is important to follow the steps, when done simplistically, parts therapy is much more effective than if you attempt to make a great big gigantic thesis out of it. 
sure you can keep your client in a series of sessions for 10, 15, 20 weeks. But a question I am sometimes asked is how many sessions of parts therapy does it take to help a client reach a goal? And the answer is it varies from client to client, in some cases only one session. But I don't do parts therapy on a client's first session. So they've usually had two, three, or four sessions before I do parts therapy, and there are always exceptions. I've learned from experience never say never, because as soon as I say never, it's like some higher power hits me with an exception, generally within a week or two. And that's why I say, uh, you're never in this profession so long that you don't have to learn. Just when you think you might know the best way to do something, you'll suddenly be struck with insight of a new way of doing it, perhaps a little better, or realize that there's always more than one way to get from point A to point B. A metaphor I use in Seattle is there are several ways to get from Seattle to Spokane, which is about 300 miles away. You can take Interstate 90, which is uh, a short direct route. You can take a scenic route over uh, a mountain pass called Stevens Pass. You can fly. You can take a train. You can drive way down around the bottom of the Cascades, uh, going along the Columbia River in Portland. It'll take you a lot longer, but you can still get there. The point being, there is no one way that is the only way. And if you're looking for the only way or the perfect way, then you may be in for a few surprises along the way. The objective is to help your client reach his or her best resolution. And sometimes, as those of you who are into hypnoanalysis know, the presenting problem isn't always the real problem. It might be a symptom of some other issue that you either may or may not be qualified to help the client with, depending on what the issue is. For example, one time in a situation with a lady who saw me for weight control, where I had to use parts therapy to help her resolve an inner conflict, that one part of her that uh, wanted to get rid of the weight was bound and determined to get rid of the weight because it was the proper thing to do. And then that part of her that uh, wanted her to stay 30 pounds overweight said, I'm not getting rid of this weight until that male chauvinist pig I'm married to overcomes his bias against fat women. Well, in that particular session, I could get no compromise whatsoever between the two parts. And basically, that part of her that wanted to get rid of the weight finally admitted to the other part, well, the only reason I want to get rid of this weight is because uh, I'm tired of arguing with my husband over it. So uh, I ask if both parts would agree to uh, discuss it at a conscious level before uh, deciding where to proceed from there. She comes up out of hypnosis, and I uh, asked her if she had considered marriage counseling, to which she said, well, uh, it would be an excellent idea except for one thing. And I said, what's that? She said, my husband is a marriage counselor. <laughs> <laughs> and I thought when she left the office, well, you can't win them all. But I had to tell her ethically, uh, your subconscious has made it very clear that uh, it's not going to let you.